so you've been living with the record for a while now. It's been out for a while. Yeah. How's it? How's it feel? How does? I mean, how does? It, how does the record feel to you now, as opposed to when you finished it? Oh, I mean, it, it's just the usual thing. Like, wow, if we could only record these songs now. <laughs> so, it's like we, you know, we we make the records in order to have something to play live. You know. Yeah. And so then you have the songs to play live, and then they get better. You know, when you play them live. You always feel that way because some people kind of the longer the songs sit with them, the less the I less they like them. I don't feel that way. No, you you so so I mean songs that you wrote back in the late eighties. Do those still feel as good as? Yeah, the ones I play certainly do. You know? <laughs> if I don't if I don't feel it, I don't play it. Okay. You know, I mean if, but yeah, I mean I did, I don't know. I it's funny because I. You know, when people say, like, I'm sick of that song, I'm like, I don't get sick. <laughs> I don't know what's true. I don't know what exactly. I mean, I have a lot of songs to choose from, but the songs that I've right. chosen to to play and perform over the years are like, I love them. I mean, I'm just, gonna, just flat out. I love them. I love to play them. Every time I play them, I feel like it's a, n- a new opportunity to play it better than I played it before. I mean, and I, you know, and especially as the tour progresses, I just get more, as I get more and more acclimated to the to the new tour and the new, um, you know, for lack of a better word, the vibe of the tour. Yeah. The more I just feel like I can just bite into the songs and make them into something that they, you know, they're not on record, you know, make them even more immediate, make them more powerful, make them more dynamic, you know. And so I I feel like every show is an opportunity to almost like re-perform a song and make it really good, you know, (laughs) or make it good, period. Right, right. That's that's an interesting way way to look at it, especially because I don't know. Like I said, you know, I talk to a lot of people, and it's sort of uh, songs almost exist only on the record. And some then, do. Some songs only do exist on the record, you know. But I mean, like philosophically, where it's like, oh well, I'm just recreating this. Oh. Where in your it sounds like the way you're talking about it, it's sort of like, no, I'm making this a a new living thing every single night that we play it. I actually believe that. Really? <laughs> I do. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know if that's like a really a vain part of me or whether that's something that's just this real. But actually, I think it's even more vain to just say, no, I, I'm, I'm over that. I'm moving on. I spent my time writing that, but now it's on to something different. I'm like, well, be a novelist then, because. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, if, you're, if you're a performer, you, you know, you perform songs. That's your. And yes, you know, you can make a new record, and if you're only going to perform your new record, then you're going to be... I mean, I'm sure there's some people that love that and love bands that do that, and <clears throat> I personally think find it really pretentious, but yeah, that's me. No, I could, I could see that, you know, and especially when a lot of it depends on what the band is and what they do. Exactly. I mean, sure, I'm, there's some bands, I mean, I mean, I used to get excited when I was a kid, I would see... You know, I'd go to see Husker Du, and they would play a record that they hadn't recorded yet, and I'd be like, great. Right. You know, I didn't care that they didn't do the hits. I mean, I was like, wow, they're doing something that I've never heard. Here I am, you know, experiencing it for the first time. That that excited me. Now, I find that really annoying. <laughs> Although, <laughs> you know, if I went to see Husker Du now, and let's say I was in it, and they, all they did was their new record, I'd be like, Damn. You guys are jerks, you know. <laughs> Play the songs we like, you know. No, I think it's fair, but th- that's also, I guess, for a, a specific band, like that's you know, there's a time and a place when that makes sense too. Because uh, if Husker Du were still around now, I don't know if anyone would want, you know, not nothing against Bob. Well, yeah, yeah because I, I loved his new record, but at the same time, it's sort of like. Well, I mean, he. I mean, now when Bob Mould plays shows, he—I mean—he's right. actually gotten great bands together, and he plays—he plays stuff that Husker Du would have never played. I know, I know, great stuff. I saw him last year so, I mean, here in you town. Know, he kind of got the message, you know, over the years that it's—you know—you play, you play the old stuff and and the new stuff, and you keep people happy, you know. Yeah. Work with your audience a little bit. That's a part of the thing too, though. Like he got together a, a he put together a band basically just to go out on the road and play. Yeah. Like. To be as tight and as raucous as possible. They were better than Husker Du. I can say that. <laughs> oh, I I don't I don't disagree. I actually I, mean, I yeah, having seen you know both, I would say that the yeah when he had that band a couple of years ago, it was pretty great. Yeah. Yeah, but you know uh, it's uh, John Worcester and Jason Narducci. Those dudes yeah, are. It was great. They're great really, dudes. Um, really good. So yeah, I'm, I I am interested in that in in the idea of sort of how you work with your songs then. 
so, I mean, when you say that you, you try to make them come alive again every night, is that is that for you? Is that for the people that are listening? Is that for... It's for both of us. <laughs> is, is it is for everybody? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... Yeah, I mean, it's from, you know... Yeah, of course. I mean, I want to, I want to, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a particularly like, I don't, as a vocalist, I don't have a lot of range, you know, so I can't really communicate like emotion and in the, in the more, in the sort of like, you know, American Idol sense, you know, that people, <laughs> that people, that normal people sort of associate with it. So I'm dealing with an limited thing. So in order for me to like, you know, deliver what I consider to be a passionate, you know, performance of a song, I mean, it probably just sounds completely flat and normal to everybody else. But for me, I'm like, you know, I'm trying to infuse it with as much like of just you know feeling it. You know, I want to feel it when I play it because I figure for the few you know for the people that do care that maybe they'll notice. That's all. You know? Yeah. Well, no, I I mean, it seems like in in the world, you know, the way it exists now in the in the world of music, some people place even less emphasis on the live aspect of it because everybody can take their music wherever they go. Yeah. All the time, and. That always, I, I found that weird. I mean, partially because I'm old enough to remember what it was like to, you know, maybe never have heard of a band or heard a band until the night you saw them live. Yeah. Um, so to hear you talk about it like that to sort of create a, I don't know, like to sort of craft a, a, a whole world that exists within the show every single night. Yeah. It makes me, it makes, this is going to sound dumb, but it kind of, it, like it makes me feel warm and fuzzy. Well, I think it still happens. I think people still hear bands they've never heard, and I think that still happens quite often. And I think it happens for young kids who go to shows. And you know, I think the fact that people can carry their music around, I don't know if that really affects the, how important a live performance is, personally. Yeah, well, it does, yeah, it doesn't for me either. But I've heard people talk about it almost like, I don't know, it's, it's a weird thing. I guess what well, it is you is... Know, <laughs> Whenever I hear people like hypothesizing by, about what modern music is or what it's becoming, I, re I think about like almost 15, over 15 years ago, I was told, you know, often and with great certainty that rock music was dead, you know, that there would never be another successful band that played a guitar, right. that dance music was taking over everything, that no club would ever have, like the clubs would eventually completely phase out live band music. And none of that happened. It's just like, you know, the Y2K scare. The stuff that people sort of, they imagine these things, these really definite and like, you know, I mean, that doesn't, that's not to say that there aren't changes that are afoot and changes that have happened. And uh, certainly, you know, with the way that we buy music and we, we listen to it. And, right. and like you said, the way we carry it around. But I think as far as just an actual performance, that's something that I, I'm not... I'm not going to be, you know, I wouldn't be, as, I'm not going to say never, I don't want to use the word never, but I have a feeling that people are going to be sitting and listening to people play music for a really long time, you know. Right, right, and that's the thing, I guess that's what it is, is, and that's part of the thing, is no matter how people feel about live music or, again, hypothesize about it or philosophize about it, when you're actually there at a show and a band is on stage and you see them and they see you, yeah, like, that's always going to be something that grabs some you know that grabs somebody sure i mean it's just the the air moving and the you know you don't you don't have control over it you know it's happening in front of you and the you know you're it's commanding your attention for that that amount of time i don't know it's great it's, it's intoxicating i love i mean live shows to me it's always i try to explain that how you know like what's the best show you've ever seen and i'm like well i can think of like dozens and dozens of shows that all hit this one level where I'm like, this is the best thing I've ever seen. You know, I mean, <laughs> whether, whether there was, I mean, and then you can't even really like get it to a point where you say one was even better than the other because sometimes, I mean, what thing makes things great is so different. You know, it's not just like, it's not just an incredible light show and an incredibly overwhelming, you know, performance. It can be someone who's just sitting down and playing a guitar and acoustic and that can be, and I, but they, they evoke the same, peak of feelings for me where I'm like wow almost overwhelmed like this is great like this is a really this is beautiful this is an expression this is like making me kind of crazy inside to see this you know I'm kind of feel crazy and giddy and tearing up you know and, and that can happen in almost any kind of combination of you know instrumentation like you know right. bullshit not bullshit all that stuff like you know can conspire to make me feel that way you know does it still happen often when you go see shows? 
It kind of does. I mean, when I, yeah, when I see it does actually. I'm a total sucker for. I'll see a band like, well, they're the greatest. I just I'm totally dumb that way. You know what I mean? I can't. I'm just like, that's great. You know? I mean, if they're, you know, I mean, I could go see the. I mean, we were at this festival last year. We were at Coachella because my my other band Dinosaur played and. Um, you know, I went to see like the OCs and they were great, like yeah. like unbelievably great, right? And then I went to see, uh, you know, Vampire Weekend, who I'm not a I'm not a big fan of the band, but like when they started playing, I'm like, God, this is great, you know? Like, like and they're and they're like almost diametrically opposed to like how raw and amazing the OCs were. Yeah. But I'm just saying that like my my whole my criteria for good music or what I like in recorded music is not doesn't translate to what I like live. It's a weird thing. I can't. No, I understand. It. The first time I saw uh, Vampire Weekend, I felt the same way because it was they'd put out one record and I was like, "This is not me. This is not. <laughs> this isn't me. This yeah, is, this is not me in my kitchen. <laughs> exactly. This is not me hanging out. Yeah, I'm not. It's not me drink. in the car. This is not. But yeah, but yeah. in a live sense, it was like, okay, wow. It blew my mind <laughs> to the point where I went back and listened to the record, thinking I obviously missed something here. Yeah, like there's something on this album that I didn't know about, but I went yeah. back and listened to it and it's still... It didn't. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but the exactly show, it. I would the show go see like, them again. Wow. Yeah. It was like, that was really good. Yeah, and that's... I would use that as a pretty good... A fair comparison. I mean, that the comparison between those two bands and how the OCs, I mean, is like, that's something that I listen to in my day-to-day -day life. Yeah. I love it. It makes a lot of sense to me on so many levels. But, you know, Vampire Weekend, they were, they were great. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, so. I'd almost forgotten about that, that that time I saw them. But yeah, um, I mean, has that always been the case for you, though? Have you always sort of felt that way since you've been doing music or listening to music? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, yeah. I mean, I went through a very brief period when I was a teenager where I thought that only hardcore punk rock was the only legitimate music form. And I'm serious, like that might have lasted maybe two or three weeks, you know. <laughs> Oh, and so and, and I swear to God, probably, years, probably, but... probably during that two or three weeks, I probably heard Def Leppard on the radio and was hating myself for liking it as much as I did. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. that's, I'm just like, you know, I mean, I was, I was, I did, you know, there was a crisis of, of you know, of uh, integrity that I, I might have had at that point. Like, how can I love Def Leppard and Black Flag as, at the same time? Right. Know? But I mean, I, that didn't last for very long. That's funny because, like, like most people, yeah, most people, that's a period of a couple of years. But for you, some it was people a, really hold on to that. Oh, oh stuff. I know, I know. But what's crazy <laughs> is when you see people that have held on to it for 10, 15, 20 years, and you see them start to fray at the edges in terms of, you know, what they do and don't. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay, and then you call them out on it, and then no, you can all hell breaks loose. No, you can call. Yeah, I, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've like I've really challenged a few people in my day about that and it's truly that you just they just spin out it's like I'm like how can you say, you know like I knew this guy who was absolutely obsessed with like 60s garage music mm. and psychedelic music and he dressed like it and and then I come to find out like oh no I, I heard that, that no he actually went to all of these you know punk rock shows when he was a kid and he really loved punk rock and I'm like isn't there a part of you that still really likes that music no like what do you mean man <laughs> can you and then just like the more that i questioned him about it, the more you like you yeah it's almost like the the fraying began the like no no you know, like you're like it's like you're all of a sudden you feel like you're deprogramming somebody it's very funny the, oh man i know i know that guy you're talking about too you know i know that guy specifically yeah it's greg ginn no. <laughs> it's not greg ginn no but I, although i guess he kind of did that whole uh, psychedelic jammy thing for a minute after that, but but now that he's got black black flag back together or something, I don't know. Is it, yeah, I, I don't know. know. I mean, I guess I guess what it amounts to is you know it's it's interesting to hear you talk about these things and to basically hear you say, yeah, for the last thirty years I've just been the same guy when it comes to how I think about and process music. Well, and I know some to things totally, change. To be honest, I mean, there, I mean, you know, during the '90s when Sebado was doing really well, I mean, I did have like. I mean, I will have like passing jealousies for other bands, you know. Really? Yeah, you know, I'd be like, "How come everybody likes pavement more than Zebedo?" You know, and I kind of feel sorry for myself for, you know, I'm just like, well, we put, you know, our lyrics are really personal, and why isn't that, you know, all that? I mean, I would, I would have those moments of jealousy or like about other bands, but the older I get, the more it's just like, who cares? My God, who cares? You know, <laughs> 
it's all good you know what i mean and you see younger bands are like are still like that it's very com- it's competitive mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just saying that competitive that's what i'm pointing out is like there is a there i did go through a competitive phase okay, yeah as a as a young and and pretty successful a musician which yeah. is ridiculous really to be competitive but it's amazing you know i mean i don't know well no that's a funny thing because what you're saying is yeah when we were doing well i was mad that we weren't doing better <laughs> and when it's retarded i mean excuse me it's not retarded that's the wrong word right, right but it's it's uh it's uh yeah it's it's dumb looking back on it it's like god really who who cares i mean it's just just music you know? well at what point did that start to change or was there i mean was there even a moment where you noticed that you weren't that way anymore uh, i don't know i guess when i really hit the my mid 30s or something maybe or just you know getting into the 30s and actually experiencing real failure for the for the first time like really experiencing like really some pretty heartbreaking things you know just, I mean, all musically, personally. Right, right, right. You know, and then just kind of coming out of that, like, whoa. You know, just, I mean, I don't, I don't, I sort of, I don't think that I was a, a particularly, like, uh, proud or, like, you know, arrogant person <laughs> during the height of my success, you know. But um, I did, you know, I became, like, considerably more humble. I don't, you know. As thing as the years wore on, you know, yeah. <laughs> just kind of like it doesn't that kind of um, yeah, because there's there's you know that sort of stuff like that cl- kind of clinging onto this idea that you should that you know you're better than something else or why do people how come this didn't blah 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 you know like that kind of stuff that sort of thinking that sort of retroactively you know trying to control things it's like a control issue almost you know so letting go of that stuff was pretty important so yeah so now you it, it, control isn't as is important oh in that sen- in that sen- <laughs> in that sense in that sense yeah no yeah. that's not no there's much more <laughs> there's much more pressing control issues in my life than what bands are than you know than guided by voice than a museum being constructed to the memory of guided by voices <laughs> you know i don't know i <laughs> I under- I understand that. Well, I mean, you know, especially when you have when you have kids, exactly. that, that changes a lot of a lot of that stuff too. It, does. it um, does. I mean, I don't have kids, but I know how that goes. Yeah. Um, I imagine, especially as a musician, where a lot of things are sort of more ethereal in nature, and then all of a sudden you've got like, yeah, something as real and concrete as possible. It's a yeah. And then you you get really it, it you become i mean i guess for me i mean it's it's been a slow process actually to be perfectly honest <laughs> my daughter's nine and i don't think i i think it's actually i've had to grow up as much as she has in the last nine years so i think a lot of people would say that though about yeah. about when you have kids because you know because the idea is sort of no one's ever ready for that yeah as ready as you think you are you're never really ready for it yeah i am i am curious though you know when you talk about how you sort of I guess you could say matured, you know, in your mid thirties. Mm-hmm. Like how how much of what happened in that time period led to being able to get Dinosaur Junior back together? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, to be the thing is, I think that I think that if like they'd asked me to be back in the band, like <laughs> I think there was probably a period up until like i think any time after the year of after 1999 if they'd asked me to be okay. in the band again i would have done it <laughs> right you know like by that point i was like i was just finding as if if, if someone had asked me about dinosaur jr and i found myself la- launching into like this you know litany of complaints against the band and all of the offenses that i had suffered at, at the hands of jay mascus and all this stuff the more ridiculous it was seeming you know, it's more was like, well, really? I mean, <laughs> so you kind of just like, stop like, believing your own. You know, well, no. At some point, you're like, you know, this actually me really holding on to this stuff is 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 me really, really taking myself seriously, which is like, for me, one of the worst things to admit to myself is like, wow, I really take you know taking myself serious. It's like, shit, I gotta really, you know, I, I have to really, you know, own up to myself that I'm I'm just as fragile and sort of vulnerable to like criticism and stuff as anyone else you know that's a hard well that's funny because you know making a big deal about taking yourself too seriously is is kind of interesting because a lot of the you know sebado songs and lyrics are 
pretty personal in nature and right. a lot of times when people write really personal lyrics it's understandable when it's like oh i you know when you spend so much time in your head it's kind of hard not to take yourself a little yeah. too seriously at, at times well i'll I mean, this sort of comes back to the idea that I'm playing the songs and living into them every night. Like a lot of the songs that I wrote that I, that I continue to perform, I feel like in those songs, I was really trying to get myself out of myself and understand another point of view. Mm. You know, it's like if, if the song was about rejection, I was trying to understand why I was rejected. And it wasn't just like, you know, you hurt me. I'll never get over this. I was never, you know, that wasn't really my... You know, I mean, that may be something that I felt, you know, in my day to day while I was going through something. But when I sat down to write a song about it, I was writing a song almost to like to throw myself a life preserver. Yeah. Like it was it was a way to go like, look, there's other ways to think about this and you will actually get beyond this. And there are ways around this and there are two sides to this story, you know. And here's the other, and I, in a lot of ways in my songs, I feel like I was able to present the other side of the story to myself yeah. So when I when I sing those songs, I mean, I, I I hear myself like actually trying to like mature within the song, you know. And I think that's you know, and to me that I I find that hopeful. So when I go back and even and when I sing these songs, I'm like, okay, it reminds me of something that I did overcome. It reminds me of something, of some way that I did actually change. And you know, and it, it reminds you know. It's a. It becomes a. It, it's like a positive thing for me, I guess. Even if it, if the song itself seems incredibly negative to people, or really sorry for itself, or just you know this incredibly self-involved, yeah, negative thing for me, it's not. I mean, I have my own reasons for thinking that, or there's little <laughs> parts of the lyrics that I could point to right, specifically. Right. Like, oh, no, see, but you know, I can't get into that too much. It's a personal thing, I guess, for me. But so it's not. It's music isn't necessarily just catharsis because some people write songs to sort of put it out there in the world. It's more, this feels kind of corny saying it, but it's more of an act of self-improvement. Yeah. In that sense. For me it is. Yeah. I mean, they become like, you know, it does. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, I have to be, things have to be repeated to me over and over again before I really get them anyway. So, so that's what makes it easy. You just write a chorus so that you're saying it again and again. And I'm literally saying it again and again, over and over again, every single day <laughs> for two or three months. You know, and maybe eventually, I'll, you know, it'll, it'll, you know, hit home. Maybe eventually. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta hope that uh, what twenty five years later that some of those songs are starting to sink in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you know that's that's uh something that uh, you know obviously relates to the new record because it's um it's a pretty it's a pretty intense record lyrically yeah in a lot of ways yeah uh and you know it's about well i mean i i'm not going to tell you what it's about you can say what it's about but you know people talked a lot about the divorce and all that stuff and how mm-hmm. that's i'm not actually divorced yet <laughs> oh is that still is it still not <laughs> the case it's still going on yeah but um, oh well those are usually i know i know how that goes well, yeah that's how you do <laughs> well no 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 uh no uh from from experiences with everyone in my family but okay. me yeah, yeah right, right i'm aware right. of how those situations yeah, play out uh, yeah but well i mean no i mean yeah it's like it's it, it's the record is a snapshot of a, or at least for my songs, and, and I always feel this way with Jason's songs as well. It's like they're 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 kind of interesting snapshots of our relationships, and you know, as they go, you know, and you know, I'm not entirely happy with the lyrics I wrote on the new record, but they are they do reflect how I felt at the moment that I finished them and I that I sang them, you know, you know. Well, I mean, how do you feel? Like, in what way are you unhappy with some of them? I don't know. I mean, I think that what I went through is an incredible... I mean, what I'm going through is a really, like... Um, you know, it's... A, it's um, I just don't know the whole story yet. Yeah. You know, that's all. I mean, I, and I don't know how to really... I mean, you know, and in some ways, I think that the songs are a little harsh, I guess. So... And in some ways, they only address one side of it, you know? Mm-hmm is my side <laughs> right right you know and there's a lot of other sides going on you know i mean there's a lot of people involved in what what's happened in my life and and i hope to in the future be able to like really look at everything and write songs that really that do really take more m- more point of views into into consideration and i can write something that's even more you know healing and more you know 
but yeah so yeah you know the new record's pretty it is kind of it's kind of rough i mean I, I was really into it when i did it but i i think now when i listen to it it is like whoa okay oh jeez yeah when how did, long did, I, that when take? did i finish that one how <laughs> like, long did that take oh yeah you right felt that way i mean was it right at like right after it was done or or did it take you a couple of months before you're like oh uh i don't know you know actually to be this is kind of dumb but like the when the first bad reviews for it started rolling in i was like oh it's like right okay <laughs> that's one way to look at it you know i was like oh yeah i didn't think of it that way you know because I, I always believe bad reviews when i get them i'm like yep that's right this is a terrible record and <laughs> do you, I mean, do you really do you, do you really give give that much credence to the to bad reviews when you're reading them at that absolutely. moment? Absolutely, in that moment, absolutely, I do. Yeah. <laughs> does, does it does that stick with you though, or can no? You it at doesn't least... stick. It goes away eventually. I mean, it goes away, especially. I mean, you know what makes it go away, which is great, is playing live. Yeah. That makes it go away. Then it's then you know as the, you know when you when we tour and then the record starts to take on the life of these live songs, then it becomes something that's like almost you know then i be then i start to feel more like invulnerable almost it starts to really strengthen me and i feel really good about it you know but but those like sort of critical moments like between finishing a record resting you know Mm -hmm. after finishing the record like okay i finished something this is and then and then the that first sort of slew of really terrible reviews where they just are you know just I mean, you make it sound like every single review of the record. As far oh, as I'm concerned, everyone was negative. Is, is that true? <laughs> no, it's, it's, like, it's like one of those things, you know, it's like you can get, you know, you can get 10 compliments and when one, one, yeah. one person can walk up to you, even a homeless person could walk up to you and go, you are a jerk. And you'd be like, God, I'm a jerk. This person never met me. How did he know that I was? You know, meanwhile, you could be like, you know, you have people embracing you and whatever. And then some, some totally whacked out person who doesn't know you could walk off like just right and maybe when i'm talking and, and then i would be i would believe that right for the next week you're trying to figure for the out next why week, that's not true right i mean i like i did i made the mistake of like there was a terrible review for the record in the onion and then i had made this terrible mistake of going down to the comments and there was oh, one no. one guy who was just like lou barlow is the biggest sham ever he's the worst bass player on earth he's never like nothing he's done amounts to any i mean and i was just like wow it's true you canceled the tour right then there. i was like wow it's really true this guy really got me on this one i mean did he did he give any examples or was it just no like someone was like gee are you serious i went to see him play live he's for dinosaur he seems like a really good bass player i've seen dinosaur many times and he's terrible he looks like he's flipping hamburgers when he plays music <laughs> and you're like i'm like I'm like wow really <laughs> that's not some as many times as i've seen you play bass and it's a at least a half dozen i never would have described it as flipping hamburgers yeah he was he was and he said all my friends think that too and i was like wow really i'm like holy i mean this but this is me looking in the comments section i know yeah of the av club and the onion which is always a mistake to look at the comments (laughs) terrible it's like like the dumbest thing and then i look at this guy is like this guy has already commented on like seven thousand other articles i mean seriously it's like like like, and i just like i was sort of curious about the guy i was like what's what's his deal like wow he's commented seven thousand times on the av i mean like like um and so it, so that that sort of helps it take a little bit of the edge off you're like okay well this guy's just sort of right but still i know how that is when you're in the middle of, <laughs> so, i mean sometimes you know i'm not a musician so i don't put out a lot of things that people judge uh I, I'll, I'll put it this way the things that i do people don't actually spend time thinking about right. uh but when i do things like that and i see people write negative comments it's sort of uh when it's someone lambasting you it's almost better than when it's someone who's just like yeah, I don't think that's very good. Because at least you can go, oh, this guy's obviously stupid. <laughs> like, He's obviously insane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As opposed to someone who's just like, yeah, this wasn't very good. I kind of thought this was dumb and it doesn't really make any sense and I don't really care. Yeah, I'm never going to think about this again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Because at least you know you're inspiring. You know, you're inspiring thoughts. You're inspiring ideas. And even if you're not happy about what that means, yeah. at least it, at least there's more than apathy. Mm, that's, I guess. All, that's all bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny uh, I mean did you read any good reviews where you were like oh okay I don't remember I, I have no idea no, so <laughs> as far so, as I'm concerned like I told you yeah. there's like there's a handful of reviews they were all incredibly negative and that's it that's the end of the story <laughs> so what would you be like if you didn't 
play shows and all you did was recorded records and read bad reviews all day. Well, I would actually, I would learn to stop reading bad reviews. I mean, you'd have to, I guess, at that point. I would stop. Yeah, I would. I, I would. I think I would get the. I would just stop reading them. Or you know, I think that one of the main things to do to stop reading reviews is is just to stop stop drinking entirely. <laughs> That's a good way to. Because only when I drink do I actually think it's interesting to look at any what anyone has to say about anything I've done. You know, because otherwise I have a I have a lot of more important things to do. You know, right? I've done what I've done. I've poured my heart into it. Now I move on. Now it's like pick the kids up at school, do this, do that. There's not a lot of time. Like, you know, there's not a lot of time to like sit around and stay up late while you're just a little bit too buzzed and start perusing the comment section. <laughs> you know, what's a good you know idea that's right I, now. that to me is like the it is that's you know that is the biggest danger. No, I understand that. Um yeah, when when you know when it's like past 2 in the morning and you're on the internet that you, yes, it's, it, nothing good happens. That's true. It doesn't true. matter. The internet I mean and um, my girlfriend and I have discussed that the internet is like it is for probably between like the time that you wake up and maybe like for maybe an hour after that, you know, like tidying up things, maybe checking on some things that you're curious about, maybe some, you know. <laughs> yeah, and that's it. And that's, <laughs> and that's it. it. Yeah. And then the rest of the day should probably be, be devoted to doing the things that you need to do in order to maintain your life style and, that's overrated and take, care of, take care of the people that need to be taken care of yeah no that's fair uh, okay so lou we were we were talking a little bit ago about you picking some songs and um i'm gonna put you on the spot and ask you to pick maybe three or four songs if you're up for it okay all right yeah and if you need to go get something to look at or if you want to that's perfectly fine well, let me see I just when I'm just picking three random songs. Then yeah, it can be whatever. If it's your favorite thing ever, your favorite thing at the moment, the worst song you've ever heard. I mean, I'll let you do a bad review if you want. If you wanna, if you wanna ruin somebody else's day, <laughs> I'm, fine, I'm fine with that. Okay. Um, all right. Well, there's a song called C30, C60, C90, Go, by Bow Wow Wow. Yeah. And it was their first single. Was that their first single? I believe so. Wow. I didn't I mean, know maybe that. it was their second single. I don't well, know. Well, no, I mean, I, I, I thought it was... It was long before I Want Candy. That's all that Okay, yeah. I just known. I thought that was a little bit later in their in their career. That's no, all. C30, C60, C90 is was early. And the song is about taping music off, off the radio. Because at the time, there was the whole, like, home taping is killing music. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there would be, like, there was, like, this, this graphic of, like, a cassette tape with a skull and crossbones on it. Like, you, by recording music off the radio and sharing it with your friends, instead of buying records, you are destroying the music industry. And I heard the song recently, and it's a really catchy song, for one thing. It's got a cool, it's got a good beat. You can dance to it. And it's, it's kind of punky, but it's very catchy as well. Yeah. And, but I thought it was really interesting, that song... You know, like now, considering the just, you know, the era of uh, file sharing and all that stuff. Right. Well, I, I Somehow it kind of took on a new importance for me when I heard it recently. Oh, oh, I know. Eidmal, what's, what's it? Eidmal Clackshaw by Bill Callahan. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, I, think, I don't think that's how you say it. It's a really, really, really funny song. And it's really poignant, too. I mean, just... That's what I love incredibly about Incredibly funny and incredibly poignant. Yeah. So many of his songs feel that way, though. Oh, my God. He, that's... That's a guy that's, like, his really, like slowly but surely become legendary you know like he just started out he was like it was he was such a he was an odd figure early on because he struggled a lot in a live we played with him live a lot and he really struggled oh really um, and his records were pretty f interesting too you know and but to just see him become who you know who he is, is yeah. like over the years has been i mean like to me now he's better than tom waits and leonard cohen combined you know <laughs> it's hard for me to argue that i mean that's a, that's a big statement but it's it is a big i mean i, I like to say it because it feels good saying it but it's a, it's a little you know it might be a little uh 
but I mean, I it's hard. It's hard. Maybe to argue exaggerating that. a little bit, but I, I honestly, I his songs. I mean, his songs really speak to me. And Eid Ma Klaksha, I think, is you know, it's also written from the point of view of a songwriter as well. Like he had tried to write a, he dreamt of the perfect song, and he wrote, <laughs> he writes down the, he writes down the phrases that, that he remembers. You know, like he wakes up like, oh, this is it, it's this brilliant thing that I heard in my sleep. And then when he finally reveals what he wrote down on the piece of paper in the song, it's nonsense. Yeah. Which I think is like, it's so beautiful. It's such a... I imagine for you it's easy to relate in terms of how that can feel. Oh my God. It's such a good song. Working through death's pain. Last night I swear I felt your touch Gentle and warm The hair stood on my arm Um, and then, uh I guess Forever My Queen by Pentagram There were, um Well, I mean, there there was a movie made about the lead singer recently mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember what the uh, name, but What was the name of that movie? Um Maybe Final Days, maybe something riffing off Final Days, or I think that's true. I saw it; it was yeah, good. But they they released one single in the seventies, and it was Forever My Queen, and it's amazing. It's one? Like, they wow. did. They only released one. Wow. I mean, they went on. They they yeah. they didn't start releasing records until the eighties, when they'd already become like this sort of post Metallica kind of speed metal, not speed metal, but stoner rock. I mean, stoner rock before it was called stoner right. rock. Right. Black Sabbath influenced heavy. Vaguely satanic rock, or maybe yeah. not so vaguely satanic. Yeah, I mean, I know they didn't start doing a lot of stuff until that point, but I didn't realize they that there were, was, they were, there was one. When, and you know, in the early 70s, they were like a straight up great American hard rock band, like one of the greatest American hard rock bands. And I think they all they really managed to release was one single, and it wow. was Forever My Queen, and it's great. And it's like, it's, it's as good as a. Uh, it's as good as Sabbath at that period. It to me, it's it's it fits right along with Led Zeppelin. It fits really well with like late period psychedelic records that were being made at the time all mm-hmm. over the world, you know. And and it's just great. Forever My Queen is a fantastic song. Heavy, fantastic heavy rock song. Okay, one more. Hold Everything by George Jones. Oh, yeah. It's a really good song. Man. It's about, he's, it's like, hold everything till I come home, no matter how long I'm gone. Meet him at the door with a 44 <laughs> and tell him that I'll get sore. You know, it's like, it's very funny. It's just about him, you know, it's him singing to his wife or girlfriend, you know, that please don't cheat on me while I'm gone. That's like... <laughs> But it's a really catchy, it's like a very, you know, the word, it's just his, it's kind of like on the sort of tail end of his rockabilly period, too. Hold everything till I come home, no matter how long I'm gone. Don't be tempted by their money and booze, nobody's gonna fill my shoes. When I get back, I won't even knock, cause the same old key fits the same old lock. Hold everything till I come home, no matter how long I'm gone. That's that's good. I mean, I could just sit here and listen to you talk about songs all night long. Oh, you've ever heard? Um, you ever heard "Let's Talk About It" by White Denim? I haven't heard that song. It's really good. <laughs> I've heard it's their first. It's from their first seven inch. Oh, okay, that's why. Yeah. And it's really, it's really raw. Like it's a. I mean, I think all their stuff. I think they record their own stuff mm-hmm. generally. I mean, they're really a remarkably creative band, but like a, an amazing live. And when I saw them once, I thought they were, it was, it was like, I, like one of the best shows yeah. I've ever seen. Like it hit all of those buttons. I was like, holy God, they were so good. Yeah. I saw them here, a, I don't know, maybe two or three years ago. It was the same thing. Like I'd heard the, you know, uh, their last record at that point. I was like, this is pretty good. Yeah. I'm into this. Yeah. The record's good. You know, and but you see them live. It's like, holy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, wow, they're on fire. You know, it, it blew it. I mean, yeah, it was one of those things. It blew my mind. And I was like, man. <laughs> This is one of my favorite bands. <laughs> yep. But their first, their first single is Let's Talk About It. It's an EP. And the song's great. Yeah. It's a really cool song. Awesome. So. Lou, thanks. No problem. Thanks so much for doing this, man. I really appreciate it. Mm-hmm.